What's up everyone? I'm Nathan Graham Davis and I'm going to re-break in as a Hollywood screenwriter. So it's week 16 and uh, I am terrified because I'm about to get notes from Jeff Willis, Christy LeBlanc and Christy Lowry who are all great writers, great people that I respect a lot. Um, and I have a feeling they're about to tear my script apart. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to give you an example of what Jeff's notes look like, this is a draft of Aftermath that he did notes on for me about seven years ago or something. And I kept it because I just think it's hilarious. You know, but like you can see how thorough the dude is. Um, and, you know, I optioned Aftermath. That that script got me repped, you know. And so the reason that I'm doing this is because I think it's so important to uh, show the, the rewrite process. Like writing a script is not just writing a draft. Writing a script is getting that draft out so that you can rewrite it multiple times. Um, I did I did four drafts of Aftermath before it got me repped. And then I did two more for my manager before we sent it out to producers. And then we attached producers and I did two more drafts uh, before we optioned it. And uh, then I did another one in order to try and attach talent. Um, so like you just end up rewriting things a lot. It's part of the process. So for newer writers, I think it's important uh, to know that that's part of the process. Um, and to know that, you know, you do need to put that work in. I don't think that you can improve as a writer unless you're getting good feedback from other writers. And, you know, that can be tricky at first when you're new and you don't know anybody, but it's totally possible to network with other writers online. That's how I met Jeff before either of us had had um, any real professional writing experience. He was a development exec at that time. Um, but I met him online and newer writers can totally do that. You just reach out to people who are other screenwriters and make friends and give each other feedback and you grow together and, and you'll meet new and, and more and better writers over time. Um, the other reason that I'm doing this is for people kind of that maybe are a little bit further along in their craft. Maybe you've written a few scripts, maybe um, you're, you're far enough along where like me, you've had some limited success, wrapped an option, something like that. Um, and, you know, I, I think, it's so easy to experience imposter syndrome, even though you may have had your writing validated before, any time you write something new, um, especially when you're too close to it to know what you have, it's really normal to just be worried that it's absolute shit and that you've lost your touch and you don't know, you don't know what you're doing anymore. So, um, you know, I thought it'd be cool to just put this out there. Uh, so it is scary because they're probably going to tear the script apart. I'm sure there are major problems with it. Some of them will probably be embarrassing. This is the most ambitious thing that I've ever written. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they have to say because at the end of the day, I just want to make this thing as good as it can be. And the draft that I end up setting out to potential reps and producers and things like that, it's definitely going to be way different than the draft that I finished a couple of weeks ago. And that's just normal. So, uh, I think they're going to be joining in a few minutes. So uh, here we go. Sorry, sorry. I just realized that you are going to need a little bit of context on the script that Christy, Christy, and Jeff just gave me notes on. So it's called Ether, and it is kind of, um, it's the Sorcerer's Apprentice meets the Witch by way of Whiplash, basically. Kind of this dark fantasy, dramatic horror. Um, I don't really know what the genre is, and that's one of the first things that I mentioned to them when I sent it to them. It's about Scara, who is my protagonist. She is a young woman who was an orphan growing up in the care of the Catholic Church in misogynistic medieval Europe. And she escapes that life and tracks down her grandmother, Valdala, who was a witch living in the middle of the woods on a mountaintop. And uh, she commits her to become her apprentice. So Valdala takes her in, but she turns out to be this horrible mistress and it all just goes to absolute hell. Um, the structure is a little bit atypical. I actually started the story after the catalyst, which isn't really normal. Uh, but I thought it would be a cool way to just really dive right in and uh, get going with the mystery of it all. So uh, now you'll get an idea of how everything worked. There, hey. can you see me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. You got the Christmas tree in the background. Solid. This, 
this is as close as to, to a Christmas party as I'm going to get. So. Fair. <laughs> hey, it's the other Christy. This is going to get so confusing. What's Hi. up? How are you doing, Christy? Sorry, I apologize for this horrible lighting. Um, really quick. It's totally want... fine. Like, it's not. I don't think anybody would ever notice. Like, I mean, I don't nobody think. watches these things for the production value. Trust me. So. <laughs> well, you, you have way better production value than I would. This would be a, uh, yeah. Anyway. Man, I, I totally thought about getting shit faced for this one just because that seems oh. easier. I am so nervous about this, which is hilarious because like, I don't get nervous talking to people at all anymore, you know? And, uh, and I certainly don't get nervous over notes normally, but this is just weird. Well, yeah, I think you're a little insane to do I am. this. I'm totally insane. Yeah. So. <laughs> I would never want notes recorded ever. Would never want, yeah, I would never I mean, want my face recorded while yeah. I'm getting notes for sure. <laughs> So are we supposed to take a drink every time you cry? Is that how this works? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. We should definitely do a drinking game. So. Uh, it'll, I think it'll be a valuable lesson, not only for you, obviously. I hope you, you should get the miss out, but I think it's like a great oh, I'm sure thing that you're doing, you know, in terms of like, I feel like there's, especially newer writers too, and I've been interacting more and more, like I said, I've been doing like these mentorships and these kind of like classes for younger, but I sometimes forget like how, mystical sometimes some parts of the process seem when especially when you're mm -hmm. starting out because it's just so overwhelming and I feel like for us who's you know if we've been doing it for 10 or 15 years like we've kind of gotten through all those processes but this is one that's like I, I get that a lot like how do you people ask me like what do you do after you write something and when do you how do you get notes and then how do you rewrite it and so this feels like this is your what how do you get notes and then what do you, you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how do you take them uh, how do you make sense of them you know um, How do you not get defensive and scream at people for telling you something isn't working? Um, what's up, Jeff? Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Hey! Hey! <laughs> We're ready to kick you out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, hold on. I need to change my name to Christy, too, so that it's <laughs> consistent. We decided there's a drinking game if you want to participate. Every time I cry, you do a shot. It's totally up to you if you, if you want to be part of that. Oh, well, in that case, let me throw away all this nice stuff that I was about to say, and we'll just get right to the meat <laughs> stuff and start drinking. <laughs> Sounds good. And actually, Jeff, uh, just for fun, I grabbed this. Oh, you have, you have this the other guy. one? <laughs> so this is uh, Aftermath, a script that I wrote back in like 2012 that, that Jeff script. tore apart. Um, and he sent me a picture of this. I think you might have like tagged me in a Facebook post and like, there's just like fucking that crazy sounds like notes me. through all this. Um, <laughs> And I made him send it to me because I thought it was so funny. But that's the script that got me wrapped and that I optioned and stuff like that. So, you know, um, if you could just do that again. If it, if it makes, you, really well if it makes you feel any better, Nate, there actually aren't that many. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's great. So, um, yeah. So uh, I, I guess just, just hit me with stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess... I guess I'll start just because I probably have the most experience reading your scripts because I've read ev pretty much everything you've written. Yeah, I, I think you've read every script I've written, so which is a lot. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, like, overall, I think that, um, you know, my biggest compliment for you on this is, like, the, the criticism I've, I've always had of a lot of your work up until this point has been that it's very, um, for lack of a more refined word, like, paint by numbers. Like, you can see the way you've plotted out your stories and, like, you can see when a twist is coming. You can see when you're working your way up. And this actually felt like a natural story you were telling. So like, I think the telling of the story awesome. okay. is a lot more sophisticated than the last thing I read of yours, where it's like, I'm not seeing the behind the scenes, like machinery to like, to get the story to work. I'm actually just listening to you tell a story, which I think is a huge leap forward in your writing. So I think that that's like a real, a real plus that, uh, that I read in this, uh, this time around. Dude, thank you that that's good to hear I, I actually think that might have come from doing like three or four years of just short stories and stuff like that you know um maybe that opened that up I don't know but that's really that's interesting to hear so thanks for that um so uh, you know what let me start by asking a couple <laughs> questions and see if like that opens any conversation up what the fuck is my genre anybody have any idea because I I honestly <laughs> don't even know what this is like 
you're you're crossing genres here. You got to make a decision what yeah. genre you want to be in. So, yeah. So does it yeah. feel scattered? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I mean, it, the, there's definitely fantasy, grounded fantasy there, but you're kind of drifting from drama to horror to a little adventure. Like it's all in there. But I mean, the the things I picked up on, the solutions would be different depending on what genre you're going to go with. Interesting. Okay. I yeah, like, I, like, you got to make a strong choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think in terms of like, in terms of setting, it's very clearly like a historical fantasy. Like, you know, like there are, there are elements of those, of that kind mm -hmm. of combined genre. But again, like to Christy's point, the, the actual tonal genre is a little all over the place. It's a little horror. It's a little dramatic. It's a little, you know, like there, there's kind of a little bit of everything mixed in. So I think that in terms of, how you're trying to present it, it might be a tough sell as is because it, it, it doesn't seem to quite know what it wants to be other than the overarching like setting of historical fantasy. Okay, well, that, that doesn't surprise me to hear that because like I was saying, like, I'm not even quite sure what it is. Like, I, I think I understand what the story wants to be now, um, which is really cool. And it does feel like there's a movie in there, but like I just, uh, just told you that I don't know what the genre is. So if it's feeling scattered in that way, that doesn't surprise me to hear um does it feel to any of you like it's leaning in one direction or the other or like like it would work best in one direction i wanted this it doesn't necessarily feel this way but the moments it did i really wanted you to lean into the sort of horror fantasy okay like that that's what i wanted <laughs> <laughs> yeah I I agree because when you said the witch which by the way I have not seen although I went and kind of watched like a couple trailers and tried to like watch the the shorthand of it um I, I kind of wanted it to be a little more of that like we're at least and maybe this was just my taste which weirdly I don't like horror but like some of the more like unsettling like you kind of like dig into those moments just a little bit but mm -hmm. I feel like if you would have just like went there with the horror and maybe that's because you were you know dealing with some like the, it, it felt very grounded and obviously historical and fantasy maybe you didn't want to lean into that or because you were dealing with getting that off the ground you those moments you really didn't uh get into but I kind of wanted that to kind of just go there if you were going to like touch on it you might as well just like dive in but that may okay. not be also what you want but that I kind of was like wanting a little more from some of those moments that you kind of presented um as a little more on the horror side but again that may just be my taste no that's okay I mean like, you know, um, so the movie The Witch is like um, definitely an influence on this because I, I really loved like the way, I don't, have any of you seen that at all or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it is, it's it's a very grounded horror movie, but it's certainly, I think you would call it a horror movie. It's, it, there's no mistaking what it is. It's unsettling, you know, the entire time. Um, and so this feels like it's kind of dipping its toe into that, but then backing away from it at times. I don't think you sustain the tension enough mm -hmm. to have it be solidly in the horror genre. I think that's the biggest issue with it. Okay. Can you tell yeah. me kind of where, where is it losing tension? I, I think I might have a couple ideas, but I'm really curious to hear. Um, okay. So you have the, you have this really compelling personal story for the main character. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to give away on, on this. Talk as much <laughs> as you want. I'll just cut around it if I have to. So, okay. Like, it, it's, just dive right in like nothing's off the table. It, like, it's a really compelling story, but n not once did I ever fear that she wouldn't reach her goals. Okay. Um, and there's, there's this personal story, but there's no sort of bigger threat outside of it. Yeah, I definitely, in the way that I break down my notes, I usually, you know, obviously I do page by page just because I, sometimes I like to give reaction stuff because I know some people, because I feel like writing is very much like a, yes, you're writing for the craft, but you're also basically trying to manipulate reader emotions, right? That's, mm -hmm. and that's all yeah. movies do essentially. So in, in thinking about that, like I kind of clock, like, here's what I felt, you know, in the first five pages, 10, do I see where it's going? Do I understand? I, and I, and I agree with you, Christy, on some of those things, but I wrote, uh, in kind of my then I go back and say okay if I had to pick like the three to five largest notes but in that one of it was 
I wrote, I'm halfway through and I don't understand what is at stake physically and even emotionally a little bit, which I think emotionally, you know, I, I think I know what you're trying to do there, but physically I was like, you know, and I know you have some reveals that come out about like why um, your main character is there uh, and kind of her. Right. Um, those, a lot of those do come later. So, so there's not enough. That, yeah. I was like, I don't up front on, on the A side of it. Like, I don't understand why she's here, what she wants and why she's doing this. And like I said, kind of when you get to some of those moments, you're like, oh, I could see that. But it, it it's hard to sustain. Like, it's hard to tell a reader, wait, wait, wait for the moment, you know, or just keep oh, reading, sure. keep reading. You'll get there. Uh, because you're not over their show to do that. So I agree. I felt like a lack of, um, and I, and then when I got to that, I was like, well, it's not the kind of story I thought it was going to be anyway. So it's not like to say like, you're supposed to have some big monster that was supposed to come and she was supposed to use her powers for, but I did, I did definitely feel that kind of, um, lacking of, of stakes or what was kind of like the bigger thing that was going to culminate to, I guess, in, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I, and I do notes pretty much the same way Christy does, which is like, as I read through, I'm taking page notes, and then I go back and kind of like, look through everything and figure out what my like, overall kind of note. and you've seen that Nate, I always send like overall notes, and then page yep. notes. And I think the big note that I had kind of kind of that skirts along these two things is like, for me, again, with as with the others, like, I didn't quite understand, I don't think it was well established why she's there. Because and I think that's particularly pronounced in the fact that like, more than once she leaves and does this whole like maybe I can like lead a normal life and be a you know and be a wife and then she like decides no she can't do it and then comes back and that was actually one of my questions uh, keep going but I, I, I want to come back to that and I think that the thing that really undercut it for me is the fact that it happened more than once like if that were uh, the that natural if, if, that, if that were the <laughs> if that were the nat natural progression of the narrative where after uh, Valdali like kicks her out and then she says, well, then I, this is done. Maybe I should try to start over. Like that seems like a natural like progression of the story to me where like she's out, she's done. She, you know, I know you'll have to cut around this part, but you know, she's, she's, you know, I'll just or whatever. Do like a big bleep. <laughs> yeah. Just, just really long bleep. Um, but like, so to me, it feels like that would be the natural point where she's like, maybe okay. I should give this a, a try and then realizes she can't because she can't just lead a normal life. But you really undercut that by doing that early on where she gets cast out like, like right away. She's like, hey, I want to be a witch. And like her mom's like, nope, sorry, go away. And then she goes and meets, you know, Eigen the first time and comes back and is like, yeah, I tried, but I don't think I could do it. So it's, it's okay, like, so, so doing that in the first act just doesn't work at all then. Because you, you basically so. hit the same note again. So like all of your big climactic, like, like, can she do this or what is she struggling with is kind of undercut by the fact that in the first 20 minutes, we already know she can't. And you're just kind of retreading on it at the I, end. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got there quickly because that was one of the questions that I've, as I've been thinking about this, you know, in the last couple of weeks, that that's one of those things that felt, I was wondering if that was working. Um, so another thing it seems like you all feel, which is great, like I love that you're all on the same page, um, is that I'm, I'm holding back to, or at least I'm not giving the audience a compelling enough reason for her to be on whatever her journey is. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it really she, hard to stick with her, so. Yeah, she, she does have good reasons. She has her right. past trauma. But they don't get revealed but, until like right. 60 pages in. Like so. you might want to rework it and start with those traumas, obviously hiding the, the, the child part, but mm -hmm. show her traumas and basically establish a bigger world that would kill her if she became a witch and she goes and does it anyway because of it. Like suddenly there's stakes. She's doing something that could get her killed. So it's bigger than just her and her mentor. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if you make the if you make the initial encounter in the town once Valdala throws her out, like kind of the first time and says, like, come back, like if you up that tension a little more and up those stakes, and again, like we're all talking about making it more of a horror kind of a thing, then I think you do a better job of establishing the stakes of if she chooses to go forward. So that way, like when it does come to the point where she gets cast out, we understand the risk she's going back to town with you know, now that she's, now that she's learned these things, because the first time she goes down, it's, it's a little unclear, like, yeah, she's not supposed to be traveling without a husband, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's a very, you know, it, it's a, you know, big patriarchy, and it, it, like, there's some risks there, but it's not quite, it's not quite fully established what those risks are, so I think you need to really, 
kind of show the show the true like dangers of pursuing witchcraft in this world because then it makes the conscious choice to go back and still pursue that that path much more pronounced and it gives us a, a much larger feeling of dread once Valdala throws her out again again at the like at the climactic moment because now we now we're thinking not just like you know it's not oh no like oh no like she had a fight with her mom and she has to go back to town it's like oh no she has to go back to town where bad things are going to happen now that she's a witch okay um yeah that makes sense so i mean it it almost sounds like it would make more sense to you know show us like you were saying just show some uh trauma early on like in a town or whatnot and then have that be kind of what compels her to go and seek her uh, grandmother out and and uh and all that does that does that sound right I'm on the right page there i mean one thing that i'm curious about also is um so if i was going to lean into horror I think one challenge that I'm having there is that the story feels like it really needs to be about the relationship or the potential relationship um, between Scara and Valdala, right? And because Valdala is also kind of the antagonist in some ways, although in some ways the, the misogyny of the world is the antagonist, um, but uh, because Valdala is kind of the antagonist, if I'm leaning into the horror, I'm not sure how to like do that and also try and you know create this potential relationship at the same time does that make sense yeah well i i wonder in how you say that valid dollar character because in a sense and and i don't know if you mentioned it somewhere earlier and i just missed it but like it took me a minute to figure out this was grandma i don't know why until you like you put it in the action line i was like did i, I literally wrote oh. down, like did i miss something um, I know that was mentioned about, uh, like she mentions who I assume was her mother and stuff, but, um, but always felt because of their interaction, a little uneasy about that character anyways. <laughs> and I think that's not a bad thing, right? Even if we know it is obviously her grandmother, it's like, she's come to her, she's clearly a little hostile up front, but I just wondered if, if you wanted to play the horror angle, like clearly there's more to that character in terms of being a witch and being powerful. Um, but yeah, can she, can Scara trust her? Like, and then maybe you don't want to go that route, but is there a sense of like, you're meeting this character and it's like, we're not really sure who she is. Scara's not really sure, but like, are her intentions good? Are they bad? You could lean into something like that. Or are you looking, you could be also looking just for like an outside force too, to be the horror thing. But to me, the, where I could see the tension building is because where I felt it a little bit anyways, is just like their dynamic and relationship. I was like, right. At any point, is this woman just going to, you know, kill her? Like, I don't know, because she just seemed like very just the way she was kind of like, um, you know, a little push and pull with her anyways. I was like, I was just waiting for her to like have a moment and like snap. Um, so you could either play to that tension or then if not, you're going to have to look to like an outside source to provide that. Yeah, like, I horror, mean, you know, I, I want it to, I mean, the, the closest, you know, comparison I have is the, the relationship in Whiplash, you know, and so I want it to feel like there's, there's potentially a, there's potential for maybe like this close uh, mentor mentee relationship, but also it could completely go off the rails at any moment uh, and she could kill her, you know? Um, and I, the reason that I wanted to play with that is because I think, you know, this, this world uh, was such a lonely world for women. Right. And so there was, there was so there's so much potential drama in there in so many ways to, to draw that out in that relationship. Um, and so, you know, this is potentially a chance for them to be less lonely if they can make that relationship work, but also by pursuing their goals, it kind of automatically creates a problem in that relationship. Does that make sense mm -hmm. at all? Like, Yeah. I was thinking like, so for me, like, and this will, this is going to be a little a little weird because it's going to bring together a couple of my points and also actually one of the things I liked about the script which I might now be telling you to throw out but like one of the things <laughs> I really liked is I like the fact that, that, that there was a that there was like a callback to things so like the fact that she only learned one spell but then it came back and and she did get stronger with it and being stronger and having an expertise in that one thing is what allowed her to beat Valdala when the entire like point of her training was to get her to perfect something so like I think there was a really nice note of like a callback in that but in this conversation the thing like I think that to me if you're looking to both infuse more genre elements and make it more horror and also give 
an antagonist that like is clear and easy to identify with, I think that antagonist is the magic. I, because, you know, a couple of times you mentioned like literally when, mm-hmm. when again, bleep this part, when, you know, <laughs> all she really says, and I, I'm literally looking is like, it imbues powers to those who consume it. And it's unclear about what that actually means. And then she yeah, makes, and then she makes kind of references, like, especially at the end when she comes back and like, and Scara's like, so I guess you're going to kill me now. And she's <laughs> like, yeah, I can't disrespect the old ways. Like, you know, let something bad happen to me. Like, I think that you are skirting around the idea like skirting around a really strong idea here, which is that the magic is dangerous. Like the things that she's learning, if she doesn't do them right, are really, really dangerous oh, and potentially that, horrific. That feels so obvious. I should definitely be leaning into that. And I think that that also gives you the opportunity to create more tension throughout the second act, where it's not just Scara trying to perfect one thing. It's Scara trying to teach herself the things that Valdala knows that she can't learn because she's not skilled enough. So like, we need to know what you know, what spell or what, you know, ritual she's trying to learn to like, for example, raise her baby or bring her baby back and why that's dangerous. Because if she flirts with dangerous magic, there's your antagonist and there's your horror right there is things gone wrong when she does things she doesn't understand yet. And Valdala's motivation comes from trying to teach her, you know, that restraint and that responsibility necessary to to effectively do it. And her, you know, again, kind of the you know, the, the Disney Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice version, which is well, just doing say, things you don't understand to leads to trouble. Okay, that's interesting. Um, you know, and that act, the Sorcerer's Apprentice had originally been something that had kind of led me into like the Sorcerer's Apprentice meets the witch. And then I kind of moved a little more away from that. But that that is interesting. Uh, it seems like something that I should be exploring. So that's cool. Um, yeah, I think that's a great note, Jeff, just because the magic, like you said, the antagonist, because to me, it would help me understand why Valdala is also kind of the way she is. I understand she is, you know, obviously the grandmother and kind of this witch and all these things. But I, I also question at times why she was just like personality wise, the way she was, aside from like, I'm sure, you know, being a witch in that time and person like all those things, but like towards someone technically she shares a blood with but if if it is the magic that is danger or there's something that you know she's getting into I can see her I just understand I feel like I understand that character with just adding that addition a little more just adds another layer for me right off the top but yeah. um I, I mean ultimately the magic itself isn't you know isn't I don't want to say like it's not scary in and of itself the things the the spells that are exhibited in in the script are, you know, gusts of wind, you know, enlarging fires and creating, you know, fireballs, freezing water, like that, that kind of stuff mm-hmm. does make sense in terms of a magic system, because it is all reliant on natural elements and how to it's manipulate them. Yeah. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't create a sense of real terror or horror, if that's what you're going for, where it's like, it's like, you know, you see a little bit of it at the end during the climactic battle, when you see how Valdala uses it to fight other people. And I mean, like, yeah, like freezing a guy's head in a pond, like upside down where he can't breathe. Like, yes, that's dangerous, <laughs> you know? Um, but Best like, scene, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, and that scene was, re- was really good because it really exhibited the dangers of the magic. But I think, again, you know, I think you need, and one of your questions to us early on was, you know, does the magic work? And the thing is, like, I think the answer is, you know, yes, the magic worked for me in the sense that, like, I understood how it worked. I understand the idea behind circles and rituals and power words Um, that may be because I'm a huge fantasy nerd (laughs) that loves magic systems. But, like, that made sense to me. What didn't make sense to me was the scope of the magic. What can you do with it? What can't you do with it? And I think that in order to, again inflect better tone, show why Scara is more interested, stuff like, like, show us the darker, more powerful, more supernatural side of it. Mm -hmm. Show us what's possible with it so we know, or at least warn us of what's, warn us the dangers of what you could, what could happen from going too far, because that creates much more dramatic tension, much more of a reason for Valdala to be who she is and be like, no, I'm not going to teach you this stuff, (laughs) you know, because you have to learn the basics before I can even think of teaching you, you know, more complex stuff, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, add to that, I, and that, go ahead. And I don't, sorry, just real quick. And I don't mean necessarily literally, but yeah, it would be nice if some like the magic came with the price a little bit, like her dabbling in that, like somewhere, however you choose to manifest that, like it, it comes at some sort of price, whether that's physically, emotionally, something that would be great. Cause otherwise, like you said, for her to keep doing it, it's, it's kind of easy right now, right? Just to keep going down that path. Nothing's blocking her. 
Yeah, ultimately, right now, it's not really a choice for her. Like, for right now, like, you've clearly established that the normal world is not one that Scare is comfortable in or satisfied with, and that the magic is something that she wants, both for a very personal reason, but also just because she feels, you know, outcast. So you've made such a clear delineation there that there's no drama to the scenes where she's, you know, quote unquote, considering, you know, rejoining the normal world and being a wife, because we know she's not going to do that. And I think that that's, that's something that you need to kind of refine a little bit is you either need to make it clear, or sorry, you, you either need to have her really question whether or not that's a, that's, a re, that's a realistic option for her and have us believe it, or you have to rule it out and then not use that as a, as a, you know, as a lever of dramatic tension. So, all right. There are like a billion really good things in there from all of you. So thank you. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, so first of all, look, one thing that I had been going for, and it sounds like it's not working at all because it's not allowing me to get the tension I need. I had, I had liked this idea of trying to play with me. The magic maybe not being real at first, like not being sure whether or not the magic was a real thing and, and holding back on that and then slowly trickling it in um, and it becoming more and more obvious until obviously, you know, kind of middle or partway through the second act, you know, it's a, a very real thing. And so it sounds like by doing that, I'm not setting it up well enough and I, I'm killing some of the potential tension. Is, does that sound right to you or? I, I yeah. like yeah i mean <laughs> and, and I mean, to yes be clear, is a great answer so <laughs> it should be clear like like the scene when she's first showing scare magic and you know mm-hmm. she blows out the candle and it's so subtle that you're not sure if it's real or mad like those moments are actually really good because it does speak to valdala's mastery and scare's lack of understanding about how magic works but i don't think you can raise the larger question of is magic real because then the question is well then is Scara just on a wild goose chase from the very beginning because she's not even sure that this thing exists and is possible. And you know, like it, it really punches holes that's in the logic great, of the rest of your script. Right. Yeah, and you know what, I think um, that's it, honestly, that, that, that idea is not really important to the central story, you know? So um, it's not something that needs to stay. Um, so thank you all for pointing that out. Uh, another really interesting thing was, um, and, and so you've all kind of touched on this is, she went she goes back twice to the town right um and believe it or not in the outline it was three times <laughs> so so at least like i, I s- somewhere back in the subconscious i, w- I was on the, the right path there <laughs> but uh anyway it sounds like i really need to set up a little bit of a draw for her to come back because it doesn't feel like there's there's not enough like it's it's hard to buy her actually wanting to go back to the to the real world and 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 make that decision and, and, and join it. So it sounds like there needs to be some sort of draw for that for us to believe that she might actually go that way. Does that sound right to you? Or, or she has no other choice. Yeah, so, she, is, so I didn't make it feel like she had no other choice. Um, no, it just seemed convenient. I think maybe part of that too is that for for me, like, I think you did a I think you did a good job of spark of, of like sprinkling in the backstory. But in a lot of ways, I think it was a little too subtle because I it's not until super late in the script that we even understand why she can't go back home at all. So mm-hmm. it felt a little weird to me to have her. Obviously, she gets turned away by Valdala at the beginning, and she goes and spends the night at the town, the nearest town, the first time, which like which makes sense. But it kind of threw me that she went there pretending like she was looking for a husband and like, again, kind of giving up on the whole idea rather than just being like, I just need a place to stay for the night. I'm like passing through. And again, you know, that may just involve clarifying the rules of the world and why and why a woman traveling alone in this world wouldn't be just passing through. But it was weird to me that she got turned away and was like, maybe I can make that, a life. That's exactly town. why I was trying to do that. So you at least you understand that and it sounds like if I was going to go in that direction I would need to clarify that but I don't think I am based on the notes that you're giving me I mean I think I I clearly need I'm, to I'm rework here. the the first act so Nate, is there a reason you want it because I honestly I feel like the same thing as Jeff although my I wrote my solution and maybe is not what you want because I I had an issue with like going for one finding Valhalla what seemed to be not easy 
I don't know how long she's been looking pre-script, but like just from what we saw in those, you know, 10 pages or whenever she finds her, I was like, okay, finds this woman she's looking for clearly easy. They have a, you know, a, an exchange that's not like, it's a, a little hostile, but anyways, enough to like, feel like she needs to go on her way, whatever it was she was looking for. She's not going to find it here, goes to the town. Like, and like what was mentioned, didn't quite see the, the, the thing that thrust her back, but then kind of came back easy. Um, so I just questions like, is Valdala just somewhere and you get to later, like, and I know we're talking about starting, maybe, maybe your script is like some of those traumas, but because I, because a little bit of my issue was like, I, like I got to the five pages, like, because she's looking for something, but like, I was having trouble, like picking up even within the first 20, like, what is actually, what am I going to be watching? Like, what's like, I even wrote 20 pages. And I was like, I wasn't really sure of the movie I was like getting into. I was like, okay, she's looking for a person. Then she left and came back. And then she found this person again, but because of the motives, I was like, I don't, I'm not really sure why, but is there any reason, is there something about that leaving and going back? Is it, you want to show that she doesn't have a choice she has to be here? Cause I think part of my issue with, with a little bit of that is cause I didn't understand what she was doing up front anyways to begin with. So it kind of made those moves like not hard for me to track. I understood, but I didn't understand why she was doing them. So I was trying to like truncate them of like, maybe she goes to the town and something sends her there, but in talking, I don't know that that's the right answer, but I did flag it as like the, the, the there and back of it was like, um, odd, odd for me because it felt like it was just kind of a half step or you were like delaying something but I couldn't figure out what it was at that point um, but I'm curious why did you have so much back and forth like you said you had three three of them and you cut one but so what I was trying to do was to um, create the situation where so, so Valdala, her, and I, it sounds very clear to me that I didn't do a good job of explaining this at all. And, and so that's one of the problems here. Um, it, her trauma is that Scara's mother, so Scara is Valdala's granddaughter. Um, Scara's mother ran off, um, you know, with a Christian guy when she was like 13, 12 years old, uh, got married. Um, and you know, kind of left behind the old ways and everything. Uh, and Valdala tried to, you know, maintain some sort of relationship with her and was basically run out of town. Um, and, uh, you know, threat, her life had been threatened. And so the idea of Scara coming back and uh, basically she wants to make sure like that she's here for real. Like she does, she has no interest in, uh, you know, revisiting this part of her life, um, unless it's actually for real. So she, she wants to know that, that, that she actually cares. And so she just, she's pushing her way to see if she actually comes back. And so that was where my head was at with it. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, that whatever I end up writing, like it's going to be driven by that backstory for her. Uh, that's what's driving her and, you know, loneliness, by the time I'm done, should be a really big theme in this whole thing. I I think that the the issue, like I think that that makes sense to me. Like hearing you explain what your what your motivation was makes sense. I think where it got derailed a little bit is when Scara goes back to town. It becomes it. It's no longer about that arc for Valdala. It switches back to Scara, and it's a really weird detour where then she's like again seems to be questioning whether or not like her motivation for even being there, you know, whether she's making the right choices. Like, like, you know, the, the, like the, the stereotypical like cliched version of this is, you know, Valdala's like, no, go away. And she like, you know, Scara sits out on the front step, you know, for five days and she goes, go away. And you know, she, st she stays there until Valdala decides she's serious and then lets her back in. But like, it's which I, fight club. Yeah, so. exactly. But like, that's the kind of like, I think that I think you went too far in the other direction and did too much of a deviation from that like from that moment because if all you're trying to do is establish that Valdala turns her away to see if she's really serious and comes back, you don't need a five to ten page diversion where you're unsure why Scare is there. Like, or it, even if she goes back to the town to stay for a little while, like it should be clear that she's there temporarily before she tries again. Not that like she may consider staying until she all of a sudden realizes, surprise, no, I don't. Like. If she goes to the town is like, no, I'm just staying here for the night or just passing through or just trying to like, you know, 
pass the time until I can go back and try again. That I think will fix that issue where we're all a little unclear why she went back to the town the first I'm time. I'm pretty confident already that I'm throwing all that away. <laughs> so I think what, I mean, it, it just from talking to you, it feels like a more natural progression is I need to start um, in a town or something like that, or at least make it clear. So um, Christy, without the Christmas tree, um, <laughs> you were uh, you were saying how like every, you know, she's searching in the beginning, right, for five pages, but you're not sure what she's searching for. You don't know how long she's been doing it. Feels a little easy, right? And so it shouldn't feel easy. Um, that's not the way I wanted it to be. You know, in my mind, she's been out for like three weeks and she's got no food left um, and hasn't been able to track her down uh, because, you know, there's no GPS and uh, not a whole lot of maps and not a whole lot of trails. Um, so anyway, uh, it seems like maybe I need to, to show some trauma uh, in the beginning, um, you know, not necessarily her whole backstory of trauma, but um, show her potentially even flirting with magic and being run out of town for it. Maybe, maybe I show her kill the priest uh, in the other town that I had alluded to or something like that. And that sets it off and then show her tracking down Valdala. And then we just stay up on the mountain until after that midpoint. Does that sound like something a little more concrete to you that would work better for it or? Is this, oh, sorry, is this specifically me? Um, I mean, there is something no, interesting everybody. about- No, everybody, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, the, the, the trauma, I mean, and I think what we're all kind of poking at a little bit here is like needing, and whatever information you decide, however you decide to write that, whether it's, uh, I'm not saying flashbacks, but yeah, we start in a town and we're getting some of this, but like, it feels like we need to know a little bit more of the backstory again. What is driving her? What is she looking for? Mm -hmm. Like, so we don't have to have all the answers. Like, don't, you know, don't load it with exposition. Like, I'm going to find my grandma who does magic or whatever. <laughs> um, but just get a sense of like, she's very driven, um, again, to to go to this thing. And I, when I say it was easy, I, I meant less so, because I got the sense of like, she was looking for a while. She was struggling clearly, but it's like, she saw this long stone house and then she goes down there and meets someone. It's like, oh, it was the person she was looking for. That's so great. She found her pretty quick. And then like I said, just kind of cast away and just went to this other town. So I was like, huh. But um, however, yeah, however you decide to get some of that, I just, I just feel like I need to understand that character a little more. And like, again, just get a sense of that she is looking for someone and maybe a little bit of who this is or um, yeah, get a sense that like she's dabbling in magic, just something to give me some sort of like foundation to understand like what the journey is she's going to go on. Um, how long ago, I'm curious, did her the the baby incident was that like a while ago is it recent because i'd be curious to relatively know. recent um okay so yeah i mean i definitely had not considered putting that on screen early on um is that why you're asking or i'm just curious yeah because i question why now i was like why why are we cutting in at this moment in the where you started the script like i said she's been searching for three weeks and i'm assuming it's because she's about to find what she's looking for but again we know nothing before and we, right. and again, and because I, I like to do this when I read, I don't know if you guys read the long line, but I knew nothing about it. So I'm just coming into like this, this girl searching in the forest. I'm just waiting. And I just was like waiting, waiting, waiting for like, I think it's a great way to start the thing to coalesce, like, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. My, I mean, my assumption, when, or at least not my assumption, but like, as I, as I read, it wasn't until literally the very end when she's talking with Han the second time she goes to town like and that's like you know 80 percent of the way through the script and she's and he's like oh hey i heard that a, you know a priest died in your your hometown two you know a fortnight ago so like that's the point when i thought i assumed it all clicked in where it was like okay like you know her baby probably died about you know recently and then two weeks ago she killed her husband or or whatever and then and then kind of left and started this journey so like i put the pieces together at that point but like i feel like I feel like 80% of the way through the script is a little too late to get some of that info where it's like, again, like for me, the thing I struggled with in terms of, in terms of the world building is I didn't understand why she couldn't go back home because it was pretty clear the first time she went and talked to Han at the gate, she was lying about, you know, or, or at least not being fully forthright. And I think you even mentioned that in the, you know, in, in their interaction. So like, I didn't understand why she couldn't go home again. And I didn't understand why this town was her only other option. So I think mm -hmm. those are the two things that you need, like that I need established for me is like, you know, 
again, why can't she go back home? Obviously something bad happened. You don't need to like explicitly lay it out, but like, tell us why she literally can't go, go home. Not that she's just a widow, but like, like, you know, why is her hometown off limits to her? And to like, why is this other small town wherever she's at the only option she has? Or, you know, slightly differently, why is it no better than any other option? Because that's kind of the, the thing always in my, in my head as I read is when characters are faced with trouble, it's always the, well, why not just do X instead? And th- through at least a significant part of the script, part of my, me in my head, especially when she went back to, back to that small town the second time, was why didn't she just go find another town? And I realize that the answer is probably because all the towns are supposed to be like this, but I think that needs to be spelled out a little clearer because it wasn't clear to me as I was reading that like, it doesn't matter whether it's, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the town name either, but like, <laughs> but, you know, Why not? like, like <laughs> it's, it's Norse, Norse is not uh, one of my strong on points. <laughs> um, like it, it wasn't explicitly clear to me that this town was no better than any other. Like I inferred that just from what I assumed you were trying to do, but like, I definitely was thinking as I, I had a couple of points in the script, why doesn't she just move on altogether? Like once Valdala kicks her out and it's over and she already knows she hates that other town. Why isn't, why doesn't she just keep moving on? I mean, we, we met her in the first scene of the script as she was wandering. So why wouldn't she just keep wandering, trying to find something better? So it just, it just feels redundant and convenient. It sounds like. Well, it doesn't have to be necessarily like, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And, and convenience yeah. is certainly a motivation to do anything. No, like, I mean, I, convenient for the story and redundant for the story, not for, not for I mean, I, I think you could easily establish, as long as you establish that like there's nothing else nearby, like if this is the only town for hundreds of miles and it was a real trek to get there, like I could see why she would default to, you know, staying someplace close, especially if she's not, especially if at some point there's a, a motivation for her to return back and try to kill Valdala, mm-hmm. because again, that, I have questions about that motivation in general, but like the, it does seem like she was planning on coming back and confronting her grandmother sooner or later. So like, again, that all makes sense that she would go back to the town that's nearby rather than venturing elsewhere. But I, I think it just needs to be a little clearer why she's doing what she's doing at any given time and why it's her only, why it's her only best option. All right. So that's, that's what I'm reading Sorry, the note behind the note is that, to me, and Jeff, what you're saying, to me, what, at least how I'm thinking about that, what I would take away is, like I said, some of the decisions for her, whether they're easy or not, but she just makes them, I'm going to go this town, I go this town, I'll leave this town, I go, but at a certain point, I think you're going to ask yourself, like, what is it either about the plot, the motivation, or what the character wants that is, again, forcing her, she is, you know, between a rock and a hard place, either if I make, either I stay here and I die, but, like, I wish there was something in like we could see in some of these decisions that were that we could get from like a character emotional standpoint of just like it is hard for her to make or she is forced to make it like something and I don't want her to be a reactive character necessarily where things are like bad things are happening around her it's forcing her to act but I kind of want to understand like I said and I know I keep going back to character motivation of why but I think if, if you could craft some of those moments of like making them harder or again it like like Jeff said it is her only option like oh that really that town where oops the boy you know followed me and got stung by bees I have to go there for x reason it's it's the only option but obviously it's gonna be very dangerous for her to step back in there where she knows like they're she's gonna be questioned or like if she killed a priest in another town like are they looking I'm just questioning all these things like why has it uh, something caught up to her and forcing her to like do all these things she's doing maybe like a a thing you can ask yourself along the way and see if any plot maybe grows out of that or yeah no i mean there's my mind is the, the wheels are, are turning like crazy yeah. right now this is all really I mean, good stuff I, I think where this is particularly pronounced for me is like and this is one of my page notes is like that scene again where you know bleep this that you know after she like valdala casts her out there's a there's a strange moment for me where like valdala says you know get out of here you know i'm not i'm not going to teach you anymore and then Scara's line literally is like, I'll go find a husband, I'll make new babies and they'll be baptized and, you know, and, <laughs> and your legacy will die with you. And I'm kind of like, well, one, like, why is that a threat to Valdala? Because that's what was going to happen anyway before Scara even showed up on her doorstep. And two, Fair. again, that's, and two, that's not really, that's not really what Scara wants. So it's a, it's a weird, almost like empty threat because it's what neither Scara nor Valdala cares about. Like to me, that's an opportunity. That moment is an opportunity to 
again, lay the groundwork for these kinds of things. Like if Scarra, instead of saying that, were to say, you, you're going to regret this, I'm going to come back and I'm going to kill you. You know, I'm, I'm going to learn the old ways one way or another. And I'm coming back to get you. Then you establish why she has to A, stay nearby, B, why she has motivation to, you know, to come back. Like it ties in better and it, and it's not, again, kind of a, a weird, a weird kind of threat that seems kind of empty because it's not consistent to either characters. Like, hate notes like this where it's like like ones like this where like that just seems like i can't believe like (laughs) i didn't notice that i mean that that seems so obvious so um that's the hard thing about a first draft is like you're you're doing all the ground like you're lifting everything from like a blank page so you're like juggling or at least for me i'm like i'm juggling a thousand things and so yeah like you may drop the ball here or there but to me this is like what rewriting style so now you can go and focus like oh totally you're the you know top three points yeah you did the hard work you wrote 94 pages i'm I'm just the one going i think i have a page (laughs) one rewrite ahead of me though which is a lot more hard work but that's okay um so if it's not a page one rewrite it's going to be really fucking close (laughs) um no but i think you have all the pieces there already like you have everything, all her backstory there. It's just how it's presented. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's a page, page one rewrite. I think it's a little reorganizing and figuring out how to really focus the story so the audience gets what, what they need. But you you already have all the pieces. Yeah, you, you already have all the answers. You, you've and I mean you know when I give you a page one rewrite notes. That's what aftermath was on on that on that title page. Is you know like like <laughs> nice nice premise. Why don't you start I over? Think, and I think I did I, two page one rewrites. <laughs> probably, <laughs> but like and and I agree. Like this isn't this isn't the case. You know this is a case of is it going to be a significant rewrite to make everything work? Yes, I think so. I think it's going to be sure. quite significant and time intensive. But all the pieces are there like you are just trying to reassemble a jigsaw puzzle in the right in the right way yeah. rather than being like i need to rethink what this entire puzzle looks like and and that's a significant difference i'm i definitely am going to need to spend some time thinking about like genre too though and how i want to lean into that so it's interesting mm-hmm. that every um actually jeff you didn't say um and maybe you don't have an opinion but um both of the christies um said that uh, it seems like it wanted to go in a horror direction. Did you agree with that or did you feel differently? I think that that's what you were kind of flirting with on the edges of the magic and the scene at the end. Like, and to me, those were the strongest scenes. So mm-hmm. I think that I'm more inclined to say that you should go in that direction. Like I read it more as kind of a, more of a drama. Like it didn't seem like it was particularly pushing limits either way, but like it was definitely like horror curious. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and as we're talking through this stuff, I think that that's the way to go because it is, okay. it's like we talked about at the beginning. I don't think you're missing, like the genre setting is clear. What's not clear is the tone. And I think that picking something like a horror tone will help you refine your choices going forward and make it more, you know, darker, more ominous. Like those, those kind of choices will help you decide as you're yeah, rearranging things how to present it. All right, that's cool. Um, I think the first act really needs to be reorganized big time, it sounds like, um, just to set up a lot of uh, the tension. Now, um, one thing that I was wondering about, and this was a late decision that I made, I actually went back and and did this in um, like the week after I finished the first draft before I sent it to you. Um, was the scene where she basically discovers her like powers by having sex with Han. Um, and I was really curious um, what your thoughts on that were. You know, I liked the, how it called back to like, you know, the idea of a, a heightened state of mind being necessary for magic and her discovering it that way. And I liked how it kind of um, played into the idea of her first going to maybe be like a wife or whatever and go back to this world and then um, discovering that that just wasn't going to work for her and kind of forcing herself out of that. So those things I liked a lot, but it definitely, I don't know, just kind of felt like an out there decision. So I'm curious on what your thoughts on that were. Um, Uh, I'll jump on this because um, I hadn't thought about it until just this moment, but um, if you threw in a couple flashbacks to the pastor during the sex act then it doesn't become sex it's trauma that brings it out damn 
Christmas tree, Christy, with the <laughs> trauma. There you go. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't have an issue with the like with the functional way that she expressed her power, like because you kind of early on mentioned that you know that the heights of emotion are what triggers it. So like you know pain, pleasure. Like I didn't have a problem with that, with the idea that that you know the height of a sex act is something that would in part catalyze her her power and her kind of connecting the dots together. Um, I 100% didn't buy that they would sleep together because I, again, you had so clearly set up that she was not interested in that life. So the idea that she's coming back to Han and trying to like, you know, trying to seduce him or try to like convince him that she's like going to be his wife. Like I didn't buy any of that. So I didn't buy the motivation for the sex scene, but like, I understand once the sex scene happened, like the catal the catalyzation of like her powers. So what if, what if, um, so you know how we were just talking about, um, she says that she's going to bleep a lot like, out of this episode. Right? <laughs> right? Try to avoid spoilers. Um, so, but she, she said, she says like some shit, like the, the bad version is I'm going to come back and kill you. Right. Um, and then she is purposely seeking like Han out, for, or maybe she doesn't quite know that right away that's but she realizes that in order to unlock that she needs to you know seek some higher form of pleasure and so she seeks Han out could, could you see that working like it's it's more active it was more um, manipulative kind and, of and up. yeah so yeah it is. I mean it is but like but uh could you could, does that sound like something that would work I don't know it's weird but I mean the the way and and I hate I hate approaching notes this way because I don't want to tell you how to write it. But like in my head, the way that I'm restructuring this this idea is that you know she she goes to learn from Vadala. Vadala says, "No, I'm not going to teach you to test her." Um, you know, Scara goes back to the town, but it's very clear that she's only there to bide her time so she can go right back and try again. So you can introduce Han and Igen and whoever else, but like don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it. And then she goes back to Valdala, she does her training, she gets kicked out, and then she goes back down. And if that's the first time that she um, is really considering in earnest, like maybe giving up the old ways and becoming, you know, a wife and like just settling down with a normal life, I think that that would be the point emotionally for that character arc, where it could be a very powerful conscious choice, where she's like, I really did come back here and thought that thought that I could be a wife to someone and Han seemed like a good choice because he was nice the first time I talked to him but then somewhere in that interaction realizes no I'll never be happy doing this so I'm going to you know try to increase my power try to study the old ways and that is incredibly dangerous in a town like this but that's why I have to you know figure it out and get back up to the mountain as soon as I can like you know what I mean if you're switching if you switch the the dynamic of her figuring out that the normal life isn't for her to the end there, then I think that that makes it a stronger narrative. And I think it makes the dynamic and her choice to use Han in that way a lot more powerful than if she just kind of stumbles across it and figures it out, you know, by accident. Okay. Uh, Christy's, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Or? Um, I have no problem with, with her using sex to get her power. Um, I just think you should you should go as far with it as you can, just so it's it, it's not stereotypical. The woman seducing. So, yeah. I agree. It's like it's a, when it's go a as fun far line. with it as I can. Is that what you mean by like when, when you're talking about flashbacks or like talk to me what you mean about that? Like, well, okay. So now we're now we're I'm bordering on the same thing with as Jeff. I, I don't want to tell you how to rewrite it. Um, I mean, I'm I'm genuinely like <laughs> if I don't like it, I won't use it. <laughs> but, you know, but I'm really. I mean, you're giving me good stuff so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, part of me wants to suggest she not only has sex with him, she kills him during it. Like, take Damn. it far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is pretty dark. Yeah. I mean, well, especially though, if you are refocusing it with a horror, with a horror lens, to, to, to Christy's point, like, push it. Like, if, if that's the direction you're going to go in, and this is what the story is kind of leading you to, like, you're not going to do yourself any favors by pulling your punches. Like, really go for it. Like, make it dark. Make it really dark. If, that, if it's a horror movie, like, it should be dark. It should be horrifying. It should be disturbing. Like, that's the whole point. 
I agree with both. I think I think it needs to be a, a like Jeff said, a, a choice of some somehow. It's not just like she fell into it. And I I do agree. You need to like if you're gonna go there, just go all the way. I mean, you're also that's somewhere towards the end of your script, anyways. Like everything mm-hmm. should be ramping up, and you know. So I think I think sex ending with death would be like ideal for that scene. Okay. So I mean, obviously that changes up. Well, maybe it doesn't. I, I kind of like, I was enjoying the uh, the scenes that followed that as those were coming out, because those were not really from the outline, but, you know, where she was jailed, and then there was the, um, you know, her potentially being about to be executed in her hands, you know, stuck stuck into the kettle and whatnot. Like, did those... Well, I kind of liked you, those, or? too. Okay. Yeah, those, those were really good. I was actually, there was a moment um, where there was a mother and a little girl watching... Yeah. And I kind of wanted some sort of moment with the little girl there, sort of a spark or an exchange where you could tell that, you know, 10 years later, she'd be seeking the same path. That is kind of what I was trying to hint at. So um, sounds like I could just do that a little bit more or lean into that a little bit more. I, so, mm-hmm. I got a hint of that. Like, I assumed that that was like, I, I try I tend to read into stuff as I read a lot and try to figure out what the motivation was. And I assumed that it was some sort of commentary on that, the fact that you focused on, you know, the, the girl in the crowd and that, mm-hmm. you know, Scara's choice in the way she interacted with the the demand to confess. Like that worked for me overall. Like I think I see what you're going for. I think it could be refined a little, but like I saw the the attempt there to like to kind of speak to a larger a larger issue but but you're right if it's if it's a horror concept then it's not just like a female empowerment like she realizes that women can be strong it's a like now i want to be a witch i want to cast spells too like like, (laughs) i I want to do dark stuff too okay cool um yeah so this is definitely it's going to be an extensive rewrite but uh this is really really good stuff um so did you have other page notes or other, you know, big motivations uh, that you felt like needed to be touched on as well? Or I, I mean, I do. I mean, and like, I, like I said, like, like Christy, I write up page notes as I go. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I might, I actually think I might type them up and send them to you. Like it might be beneficial, be if, you know, for your audience. Like, why don't I send you the document and then you can post it as like a, as a, like a link in the show so that people can. Oh, actually... I'm actually going to post it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about I, I that. Mean, look, I mean, we, Maybe, we I even have limits, Jeff. <laughs> we, ha- we haven't made you cry yet. I haven't gotten to take it a drink. <laughs> like, I'm a little disappointed that this, is, this is a sober experience. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, but, you know, I, I do think, you know, I, I do have page notes that I think might be, might be beneficial. And I mean, look, if you want to keep them to yourself, I, <laughs> I won't judge you, but, um, but I'd be happy to send you my, my normal kind of notes treatment where it's, you know, again, here's what I thought overall, here are some specific page things I thought as I was going and see if that's, see if that's beneficial. And I'd be happy to do a follow-up if you wanted to, you know, discuss in more, much more detail. Cool. Um, yeah, if you feel like, if any of you feel like typing anything up, that would be much appreciated. I've certainly taken notes and I'm going to have to rewatch this thing like three times to edit it anyway. Um, but uh, if you have other notes or whatnot, I'd love to get into those um, for sure. Uh, Christy, without the Christmas tree, is actually coming on for the next one of these, which is exciting. So um, I will probably have so many questions for you, Christy. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, it's for, good that I did that. this. So I have a. So. And it's because it's rewriting right so at least i'll have a basis for like what your yeah notes are which would be helpful for me yeah um, so i also have typed in. up notes i will send to you as well um, just so awesome. you have them i i actually had a question for the other two christies <laughs> what, <laughs> what did you think of his choice to use old norse as, as oh the, actually i did want to uh, hear what you were thinking about that yeah so. uh, go ahead go ahead christy <laughs> um i know you're going for authenticity mm-hmm I'd say dial it back about 80%. 80. Okay. Like yeah, keep, keep, I mean, keep the cadence, keep and, and throw a few words in there, but at, at t- it really took me out of the story. Um, totally I wanted fine. to j- enjoy it. And I don't think you should make executives have to think. Okay. <laughs> like that's the bottom line. I, I, I support that, that yeah. note. <laughs> I don't want to have yeah. to. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> I, like, I agree. And, and I was actually thinking the same thing. That's why I was curious what, what Christy and Christy thought is like, I think that the attempt, it was an admirable, uh, ad, admirable attempt to do something authentic and, and unique, 
but I do think you you went a little too far. And and um, I, I was hoping that they were any word that I used was pretty obvious, but maybe it wasn't. So. Here, here's the like the thing for me is it it I don't want to say it was obvious. It was it was decipherable. I could if I spent enough yeah. time reading the dialogue, I could figure out. Right, but you don't you don't feel like but, deciphering. You want to get through page after my, page. My pro so. my problem is it interrupted the flow of the read because it slowed me way down as I was trying to figure out what you were saying. And I think that if if you're going to attempt a a technique like this, especially because it's more it's more for the page than it is for the actual dialogue if you shoot it, because you know, you're gonna be saying the dialogue in a different that, way. And that's it. I guess that's what I was thinking is like, you know, on camera, since it's gonna be going at a certain speed, I feel like the audience would I mean, not this version. I know this version doesn't quite work yet. Um, but I feel like the audience would be able to pick those things up. But that's the um, thing. I think I think it'd be easier your... to pick up for an audience. I think it's harder for a reader, and I don't think you want yeah. to make it harder on the reader. And I think that if if I were going to re like if someone were hiring me to polish this and fix the dialogue, I would take the you know what's the rule of thumb that like you can use you can use abbreviated words that make sense like gonna woulda shoulda could like things that people clearly understand mm -hmm. um, are easy to swap out for. So things like wilt and thou and the and you know that kind of stuff is really easy to slip into a script and not interrupt the flow of the read because people all kind of know those generic, you know, hundred words or whatever it is in, you know, in old style. But yeah, once you get into, you know, min instead of mine and thine and harafin instead of raven, it just really slowed down the read. So I think to, to Christmas tree Christie's points, like, I think if you dialed it back about 75 to 80%, I think you would have the, the nuance you were going for without the drawbacks of cool. you know really making it more tedious to read than it should be that sounds legit so um yeah i mean i i knew i had gone too far um and that's honestly the way i try and write everything is i i'll i'll just kind of put it out there knowing i can dial it back later so i would um, i would much rather have you go too far and tell you to scale it back than to constantly like and i know that christy and christy have the same experience with other writer friends like it so often our note is take it farther, push it farther, go further. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's going to know we'll be like, good. I appreciate the swing. Now, you know, <laughs> now dial it back yeah. a bit. Yeah. I think so. pushing is harder, scaling back and cut or like pulling back the range a little is actually easier. Um, I, I do agree. Um, and also, you know, reading such a thing, you, you, anything you can take off the list of like things that will stump either yeah, an executive or slow them down. Um, but to Jeff's point, I think you can use, you know, either certain words and also there's a certain cadence probably to that kind of speak. But I, I did feel like I, I lost some like what normally if it was, you know, even regular English or what we what we use in terms of like nuance and like I probably could have read into a little bit more of like um, what would have been like the tone or the nature of how a character is. But because I was so like unfamiliar with like even that kind of like. It's like, I don't know if I should be like reading into this or like, it's a little less nuanced because I'm just trying to figure out like, what is she saying in okay, general? Yeah. And that then, but you miss too, out like, on all the you're good. You're losing like, subtext and stuff like that. That, okay. Yeah. And I think because in, in just the way that, or the language is like, not, not that all your characters sound the same, but in a sense, you have to use the same language and same words. So then there is just a, there's less uh, of a difference too. between each character okay. as well. Um, but I'm in, I'm in very much agreement. It's like pull back a little bit, but leave it because leave some of it, because if I would have jumped into a script that was in this year and there was none of that, I would have been like, it would have really thrown me off too. I'd have been like, wait, why are they speaking like they're in Yeah. And then I don't want it to be in like, you know, yeah. the yeah. colloquial, whatever. Um, okay, cool. Um, well, you all are awesome. So thank you so much for, <laughs> uh, investing so much time in this. I, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. I certainly owe you all you know whatever I, I anything i can help with drinks whatever so um thank you so 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 much i really appreciate it um thank you for letting us be a part of your experiment i'm very much yeah. uh, enjoying so, watching i, I, I mean, didn't I'm cry i'm you. sorry you didn't get the drink <laughs> so no it's it's you know it's uh, this this project in particular i think i'm i'm really i'm really happy that you're doing it and i'm proud of the work that you're doing because like it's hard to put yourself out there like that and to be honest i mean to, to get notes live on camera without actually knowing what they're going to be first like is mm -hmm. is a very brave thing to do and i think that people will find it valuable and i'm i'm glad you're doing it man like i i'm excited for you to, in this process well, thanks very much so uh on to draft two. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas to y'all. Uh, and uh, Christmas. have a great Merry rest Christmas. of your night. So, all right. Take care. You guys. That was amazing. Not as bad as it could have been. Certainly, um, you know, lots of work ahead for sure, but that's okay. I mean, that's what I expected. And I connected with everybody afterward, learned a little bit more, asked some questions, learned what was working well in the script. And there were some things that they felt were working really well. So that's super cool. Um, I just can't say it enough. Thank you so much to Christy, Christy, and Jeff for coming on and doing this. I, I mean, this is just way above and beyond. Uh, not only reading the script and giving great notes, but then coming on here and discussing it like this is just, it's super cool. You're all awesome people. So thank you so much. Much appreciated. Uh, I'd love to extend that appreciation also to Martin Aguilera and Mike Morin, who read the script independently and sent me notes by email, which is the way that we would normally do things. I wouldn't normally seek five sets of notes on a draft, but I thought that that would be useful in this case because three people were coming on to discuss it together, and I thought it would be cool to get some independent sources and see if everything lined up. And the great news is that they really did. I mean, everybody was like 85% on the same page, and that is totally what you want because when multiple people are giving you the same note, you know that it's something that you need to pay attention to. So... That's awesome. Uh, and now I feel like I know what I need to do to uh, execute this next draft. So uh, speaking of that, everybody kind of said that they thought I had the bones of something that was pretty good, uh, that I didn't need to do a page one rewrite. But here's the thing. I don't want to make something that's pretty good. I want to make a script that is fucking jaw-droppingly amazing. And so to do that, to address their notes in a way that I feel really works well, um, and also you know, still sticks to the vision that I have and feels like my voice, I gotta do some massive heavy lifting. So I am opening up a brand new document and starting from page one. It's gonna be kind of a soft page one rewrite. I know that I'm gonna keep some beats in acts two and three. So uh, where that happens, I'll just kind of copy and paste and drop those in and tweak where I need to. But act one is being annihilated. Uh, I am doing some big things like Scara and Valdala are no longer going to be related to each other, which is huge, uh, but I think it works really well. And uh, yeah, so excited to dive in. It's going to be a lot of work and I'm going to have to extend the timeline of this series by a couple weeks. Um, it's probably just going to take me a week or two longer than I thought to rewrite this thing. And that's okay. It's all about making the best script possible. So that's what I'm going to do. Like every week, I'm giving away a copy of Mouse and Mistletoe signed by myself and by Jack Purcell. If you want to win this week's copy, here's what you need to do. Go find me on Twitter at NGD Writes and find the tweet for this video and retweet it. I would love to see lots of people see this video in particular. I think it could be a really helpful resource for writers. So uh, I'll pick somebody who retweets it and send a copy of Malice and Mistletoe their way. Just make sure your DMs are open so that I can actually contact you. I want to shout out Christy LeBlanc's new movie, O2, which is coming out this spring. It's directed by Alexander Aja, starring Melanie Laurent, and it's going to be fucking awesome, so make sure you check that out. Also, Christy Lowry is the executive story editor on FBI, which is returning on CBS after the AFC Championship game. So uh, make sure you check that out, too, because that is super exciting and also promises to be awesome. Speaking of Christy, she's coming back next week, where we're going to discuss rewriting both how she approaches rewriting, and also uh, some of the notes and ideas for Ether. So make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Check it out. I'll see you next week. And thank you so much. Happy 2021. Smash cut to black. <laughs>